RDC. Welcome to day two. I'm Mary Beth Dean. I'm the manager of the research office for the space station program, in case you don't know me. I'll be your MC today. I hope everyone who was here yesterday had had uh, and enjoyed the talks. We had an amazing first day. There were a lot of inspirational research stories and insights onto expanding possibilities for future research and technology demonstrations. But wait, there's more. Today we'll hear about startups and established commercial companies who are forging new paths in low Earth orbit. We're going to hear scientists who are telling us about cutting edge research that they've been doing. And we're going to hear from some economic thought leaders. But wait, there's still more. <laughs> Free to everyone, all 851 of you who have registered, download the ISS RDC app. You need to have the app downloaded to be able to ask questions. Questions are only accepted through the app. They are not taken from the floor. So now, please help me welcome Sam Shamimi, the director of ISS from NASA headquarters, who will introduce our first speaker today, none other than NASA Administrator Jim Bridenstine. Where is the music? That's, that's the biggest question I have. <laughs> Rock and roll forever. <laughs> so, um, thanks Mary Beth, and it's great here to be uh, here in Atlanta this week, and it's great to see uh, a large crowd show up again for the second day. Uh, hopefully, hopefully everybody was found their way back to the hotel, to the conference room, that's great. Well, it's, good, it's an honor for me to introduce uh, Jim Bridenstine, uh, our NASA Administrator. You know, he's leading us, our space community, not just NASA, but our entire space community through some very exciting and challenging times. For everything that we have going on in low Earth orbit with space station, uh, uh, LEO commercialization development, a whole lot of development in human spaceflight with a commercial crew, SLS and Orion, preparing to go to the moon and on to Mars, and all the things we're doing in the, in the, uh, the science and aeronautics areas of the agency. So we have a lot, lot going on in the agency, uh, probably more than we've ever had in, in the past. Uh, for those who don't uh, know Jim, I'll go through a short bio, and then uh, we can welcome him on stage. So uh, Jim was not nominated by President Trump, confirmed by the Senate, and sworn in as NASA's 13th administrator on April 23rd, 2018. He was elected in 2012 to represent Oklahoma's first congressional district in the House of Representatives, and he has served on the Armed Services Committee, Science, Space, and Technology Committees. Jim's career in federal service began, began in the U.S. Navy flying the Hawkeye off of the USS Abraham Lincoln Air aircraft carrier. It was there that he flew combat missions in Iraq and Afghanistan and occurred most of, uh, uh, most of his 1900 flight hours and 333 carrier assisted landings. Wow. He uh, later moved to the F-18 Hornet and flew in the N Naval Strike and Air Warfare Center, the parent command of Top Gun. After transition from active duty to the U.S. Navy Reserve, Jim returned to Tulsa, Oklahoma, to be the executive director of the Tulsa Air and Space Museum and Planetarium. Uh, most recently, he transitioned to the 137th Special Operations Wing of the Oklahoma National Air National Guard. And put on top of all that, Jim completed a triple major at Rice University and earned his MBA at Cornell University. So with that, let's uh, uh, give a warm welcome for Jim. Thank you for that introduction, Sam. It's, uh, it's great to be here. Thank you guys for putting together this, this conference. Uh, the ISS National Laboratory, the, Amer the American Astronautical Society. Um, this is, uh, I, I'm, I'm impressed with not just uh, how smooth everything has been flowing, but also how many people attended. I think there were over 800 registrants for this conference, which is a big success, and I'm thrilled to see that, and it's great for uh, what we're trying to achieve as an agency. A couple of things that I think are important. First of all, Sam, that was a great intro. Some of that information might be just a little obsolete, uh, and I want to make sure I set the record straight so I don't get accused of changing my bio here. I was in the Oklahoma Air National Guard, 
1958 law that created NASA says that the NASA administrator shall have no outside employment. There were some attorneys who indicated that National Guard service is outside employment because you work for the governor, not for the president, and therefore uh, I had to separate myself from the Oklahoma National Guard. Just want to make sure the record is set straight on all those activities. Um, I, am, I, am, uh, I am clear of any outside employment. Um, that being said, uh, employment matters. <laughs> and when we talk about the industrialization of space, the ISS is a critical component of that. Well, that's what we are trying to achieve. Industrialization builds nations. And if we want to build space, we need to industrialize. The International Space Station is an amazing tool for that activity. Yes, research and development is what the ISS does. But the question is why? Why do we do research and development in space? Because ultimately we want space to be utilized to improve the human condition here on Earth. We want to prove capabilities, improve technologies, prove markets that ultimately enable us to do more in space and have more people in space, more projects in space, commercialized space, industrialized space, and of course have this be a major driver for the United States of America economically when it comes to the balance of payments and exports. That's the ultimate objective of the United States of America leading in space. And the way we do that is utilization of the International Space Station. Now, of course, this conference is put together by the National Lab, the ISS National Lab. Uh, and I know it was recently announced that the National Lab is moving forward on, on two very specific programs. One is, and I love the way they say it, industrialized biomedicine. That's important. This is a line of effort, a program, that will be transformative for human lives on Earth. It's a line of effort that has already been transformative, but I think the way they're approaching it, a step-by-step -step incremental approach with, a, with an entire line of, of effort or a program that results in end states that can be commercialized so that eventually we will have additional commercialization of activities in low Earth orbit. I think that is the right approach. Of course, the second line of effort or the second program that they're pushing forward on is advanced materials. Another capability that the ISS enables because of the microgravity environment. The reality is we can do things in space that you can't do on Earth because of the microgravity environment in space. It changes a variable, a variable that you can't change in any other way. And of course, what we have learned over the last 20 years is accelerating rapidly. A lot of people say, well, the ISS has been in orbit for 20 years, and we have to remember, when did it get finished, and when did these activities ramp up? Really, the, the maximum utilization of the ISS has been in the last eight to 10 years. And when we talk about research and development, a lot of these things take time. But we've seen some very promising technologies and capabilities that have opportunities to change lives on Earth being conducted on the International Space Station. I think uh, FLEX is a mission where we're looking at combustion. And in a microgravity environment, what we're finding is that combustion is actually done at a much cooler level. And by the way, with less carbon emissions. And the question is, how do we take what we're learning in this microgravity environment as, in terms of combustion and translate that into utilization on Earth so that our automobiles and other forms of transportation ultimately can have fewer carbon emissions. Right now, when you look at the carbon dioxide put into the atmosphere by humans, 23% of it comes from transportation. Is it possible that this flex capability that, that NASA has ultimately moved out on could actually transform combustion on Earth and result in this carbon dioxide effort to reduce carbon emissions? Could, could that happen? The answer is, I think it could. I think we are just now at the very beginning of learning what we need to learn to have that transformational capability. Um, and of course, when we talk about um, industrialized biomedicine, uh, we talk about protein crystal growth um, and how it relates um, you know, some, of the, some of the diseases that people have, muscular dystrophy, for example. Um, th there are forms of muscular dystrophy um, for which we can model 
in a much better way with protein crystal growth in a microgravity environment. We can grow those crystals uh, in a microgravity environment and then do research that ultimately enables us to create treatments for diseases like certain types of muscular dystrophy that have transformational capabilities here on Earth. So these are the, the, the lines of effort that I think are, are important, the programs that I think are important. I think it's also important to note that what happens inside the ISS is a small piece of its capability. And I think a lot of times this gets missed. A number of missions on the outside of the ISS are transforming how we live every day. Um, one, one, I think, very promising mission um, is EcoStress, uh, where we are looking at the Earth uh, in the infrared spectrum, and we're measuring the heat coming from plants. And what we're able to do is we're able to provide farmers information that they otherwise would not have that indicates the level of stress on their plants based on their irrigation schedules. A lot of people, um, you know, the farm community understands that when a plant becomes stressed because it doesn't have enough water, the stomata, the little, the little uh, I guess the, the breathing apparatus of the plant, the stomata on the leaves, they close. And when those stomata close, the temperature of the plant goes up. And from the International Space Station, looking at the Earth, we can see the stress on the plant weeks ahead of time. And based on that, we can provide uh, feedback to farmers so they can get more specific in their irrigation cycles. So they can actually mitigate drought. They can prevent um, drought uh, in, in, you know, they, they can get in front of the drought, I should say. Rather than responding to a drought, they can get in front of the drought, which I think is an important capability. And we're just proving this out, this eco-stress mission on the International Space Station. We're proving it out on the ISS. And ultimately, we'll have transformative impacts on agriculture, not just across the nation, but across the world. And it will enable us, in fact, to feed more of the world uh, than, than ever before. And of course, a lot of the technologies on the outside are helping us understand the carbon cycle, which is a, um, a critical mission put forth by the National Academy of Sciences. Uh, the Decadal Survey for Earth Science says we need to understand the carbon cycle. What are the sources of carbon and what are the sinks of carbon? And JEDI, which of course is another payload on the International Space Station, is helping us understand how deforestation and or the greening of the Earth is ultimately creating and adding to and subtracting from uh, the carbon cycle as we see it um, year in and year out. So the International Space Station, of course, What's happening on the inside is critically important. What's happening on the outside is also critically important. And then also, you know, I know the American Astronautical Society is part of this conference. When I heard that, I was like, well, that's interesting. But the International Space Station gives us access to deep space, which is also important for, for astrophysics. So all of these different tools and capabilities from the International Space Station um, are transforming, ultimately, uh, how we live and work in space. And I would say another <laughs> major benefit that I think gets dismissed um, is, the, is the diplomatic capabilities of the International Space Station. And I know people here have been working for many years to put together this coalition of 15 nations that have been operating the ISS now for almost 20 years. And I know that that's not always easy, but it's important work. Um, and we're, we're gonna take that diplomatic capability and we're going to the moon with those same partners. And we want to grow that partnership. Um, and of course, there's a lot of reasons to go to the moon. But ultimately, the reason we go to the moon is so we can get to Mars. And the reason we go to Mars, well, there's a lot of reasons to go to Mars. But in the last year, since, since I've been the administrator, it might be more than a year now. But since I've been the administrator, three major discoveries have happened. We have found liquid water on Mars, 12 kilometers under its surface where it's protected from the radiation of deep space. We have found that there are um, complex, um, complex uh, uh, carbon on the surface of Mars. Organic compounds exist on Mars. What does that mean? That means the building blocks for life are on Mars. And then, of course, the methane cycles, one of those complex organic compounds, the methane cycles, are commensurate with the seasons of Mars, which is another indicator that there could be life. I'm not saying there's life. Every, a lot of these uh, tabloids like to say, NASA administrator declares that there are aliens on Mars. So if you read that headline, don't believe it, because I never said that. 
of course, they're going to clip that, and then now they're going to take what I just said and make that the headline. <laughs> but, but the reality is the probability of finding life on another world continues to go up. And it's not just like, it's not over the course of the last 10 years, it's going up every day. At NASA, we're making new discoveries every day that indicate that we could find, I'm not saying we will, but that we could find life on Mars. And of course, the, the, again, the big, the big challenge here is how do we sustain life on another world? Well, we're going to be able to, whether it's the moon or Mars, we're going to be able to do that because of what we have learned on the International Space Station. The idea that people can live and work in space for a year um, has now proven out. Of course, we're learning about the physiology of, of humans and some of the challenges of that physiology in a microgravity environment. But when we go to the moon and eventually to Mars, we're going we're gonna to take what we've learned and we're going to see if when you're in a gravity well that's maybe one-sixth that of the Earth, the Moon, or one-third that of the Earth, Mars, does that gravity well reverse some of the challenges that we have in human physiology uh, that we're seeing, of course, on the International Space Station. So the International Space Station is a tool for research and development. What happens inside the ISS has the potential to transform lives on Earth. What happens outside the ISS it doesn't have the potential, I want to be clear, it is transforming lives on Earth. What happens on the outside of the ISS is transforming lives on Earth. And of course, what's happening with human astronauts on the ISS is a diplomatic achievement for sure, but it also is an achievement um, for how we're going to sustain life on other worlds, which of course is the objective. Now, um, a lot of you are aware um, <laughs> that uh, the ISS is being, we, we want to see commercialization. I love the word industrialization. That's what we need to see. So we have had a lot of success because of the hard work of the people in this room with commercial resupply, for example. And very soon, we will be launching American astronauts on American rockets from American soil again because of the hard work of commercial crew. In each of these cases, NASA is not purchasing, owning, and operating the hardware. In each of these cases, NASA is buying a service. Why? Because we want to be one customer of many customers in a very robust commercial marketplace in low Earth orbit for access to space, whether it's cargo or crew. And the, the next step after that, of course, is to make sure that we are commercializing habitation in low Earth orbit. In order to get there, we have to have the industrialization take place. That's why the ISS National Laboratory programs that ultimately get from basic research to applied research to end states that actually materialize in something that is industrial based that can transform lives on Earth with, with market impact, that's got to be the objective of the ISS so that we can eventually have free-flying commercial habitation in low Earth orbit, again, NASA always having a presence in low Earth orbit. We want to be a customer there. We want to be one customer of many customers, but we also want to have numerous providers that are competing against each other on cost and innovation. So then it's going to be commercial crew, commercial cargo, or commercial, yeah, commercial crew, commercial cargo, and commercial space stations, completely commercializing activities, industrializing activities in low Earth orbit for another very important reason. Because then we can use the resources that we have been granted by the taxpayer to go further and do things for which there is not yet a commercial marketplace. We can go to the moon sustainably. We can go with commercial partners with an eye always to commercialize even at the moon. We can go commercially to the moon. We can go sustainably to the moon. We can go with international partners to the moon. And then ultimately, um, we can prove how to live and work on another world. We can utilize the resources of the moon, and then ultimately go to Mars. I'm going to show a video real quickly. Um, this is a video about how we are going to the moon, and it goes through some of the architecture. And then I'll come back. We'll, uh, we'll do some questions. And then uh, I have one last video to show at the end. 50 years ago, we pioneered a path to the moon. The trail we blazed cut through the fictions of science and showed us all what was possible. It's very pretty out here. Today our calling to explore is even greater. To go farther, we must be able to sustain missions of greater distance and duration. We must use the resources we find at our destinations. We must
must overcome radiation, isolation, gravity, and extreme environments like never before. These are the challenges we face to push the bounds of humanity. We're going to the moon to stay by 2024, and this is how. This all starts with the ability to get larger, heavier payloads off planet and beyond Earth's gravity. For this, we design an entirely new rocket. The Space Launch System. SLS will be the most powerful rocket ever developed. And with components in production. And more in testing. This system is capable of being the catalyst for deep space missions. We need a capsule that can support humans from launch through deep space and return safely back to Earth. For this, we've built Orion. This is NASA's next generation human space capsule. Using data from lunar orbiters that continue to reveal the moon's hazards and resources, we're currently developing an entirely new approach to landing and operating on the moon. Using our commercial partners to deliver science instruments and robotics to the surface, we are paving the way for human missions in 2024. Our charge is to go quickly and stay, to press our collective efforts forward with a fervor that will see us return to the moon in a manner that is wholly different than 50 years ago. We want lunar landers that are reusable, that can land anywhere on the lunar surface. The simplest way to do so is to give them a platform in orbit around the moon from which to transition. An orbiting platform to host deep space experiments and be a waypoint for human capsules. We call this lunar outpost Gateway. The beauty of the Gateway is that it can be moved between orbits. It will balance between the Earth and Moon's gravity. In a position that is ideal for launching even deeper space missions. In 2009, we learned that the Moon contains millions of tons of water ice. This ice can be extracted and purified for water. It can be separated in oxygen for breathing or hydrogen for rocket fuel. The Moon is quite uniquely suited to prepare us and propel us to Mars and beyond. This is what we are building. This is what we're training for. This we can replicate throughout the solar system. This is the next chapter of human space exploration. Humans are the most fragile element of this entire endeavor, and yet we go for humanity. We go to the moon and on to Mars to seek knowledge and understanding and to share it with all. We go knowing our efforts will create opportunities that cannot be foreseen. We go because we are destined to explore and see it with our own eyes. We turn towards the moon now, not as a conclusion, but as preparation, as a checkpoint toward all that lies beyond. Our greatest adventures remain ahead of us. We are going. We're going. We are going. We are going. We're going. So there was a little love in the video for the International Space Station, um, but I, a couple of technologies, capabilities that I think are important to drive home, how the ISS has enabled us to actually do a moon mission and to achieve it by 2024. When we talk about how we land on the moon, um, you know, we look at how we're doing commercial crew and commercial resupply and how these rockets are now being used to deliver payloads to low Earth orbit and then come back and land vertically. Well, the ability to precision land on Earth, where there's a very thick atmosphere and, of course, winds and weather and a big gravity well and all of these other things, the ability to do that here on Earth is challenging. It's easier to do it on the moon. So companies that have developed that technology because of the incentives NASA has created, I want to be clear, NASA created those incentives when we said we want to buy access to the International Space Station, we want to buy access to space commercially. We created those incentives. Industry moved forward. They said, how do, how do we compete on cost and innovation? They said, we want to reuse rockets. We need to bring them home. And because of that, this precision landing capability now exists. Um, automatic docking and rendezvous and docking, all of these capabilities um, are, are born of this program, commercial crew, commercial resupply, um, that are ultimately going to be used for the architecture um, at the moon and eventually Mars. And I understand Mars is very different because of the entry, descent, and landing challenges there. But the architecture is largely the same. Um, we're going to need a, a, you know, 
a big rocket and human spaceflight. We talk about human spaceflight. Environmental control and life support systems. Uh, our partners that are taking us to the moon um, and, and other places certainly uh, are taking advantage of all we have learned for environmental control and life support systems on the International Space Station. By the way, there is so much to talk about regarding what we have learned on the ISS that will enable us, that gives us an opportunity to make a moon landing within five years. Um, I think that's important. Uh, okay, so I heard uh, somebody mentioned earlier, Christopher, I think you were going to uh, take the mic around for anybody who wanted to ask questions. First off, congratulations on commercializing the International Space Station. Well, thank you. Second, do you think the International Space Station deserves a Nobel Peace Prize? One hundred percent. So can we do it? Uh, you know, that's, I, I, I'll take that for action. Thank um, you. There's yeah. a change.org that I started. So what, what, say that again? There's a change.org. Okay. All right. I'll look for it. Thank you. You bet. That's a good idea. Uh, can you give the can you give yeah. the Nobel Peace Prize to a piece of hardware? <laughs> no, it had to go to you. Yeah, yeah. No, no. I know I don't deserve it. <laughs> NASA. Okay. Yeah. Sure. Okay. NASA. So, Jim, are you aware of the progress being made at NASA Trish to address the issues of ionizing radiation and even cancer? being done now that have already made a lot of progress on that. Uh, I am on the surface. If you'd like to share more, I'm happy to talk about it. If, sure. if, you ha if you'd like to make an announcement, I'm happy to. I will make an announcement okay. if you like. Okay, so Dr. Chris Parada. Chris, stand up if you're here. I've done this a few times. Uh, maybe he's not here this morning. Has demonstrated that you can use a simple spice, namely curcumin, to, to reverse the effects of space ionizing radiation as determined at the National, National Space Radiation Laboratory in Long Island where they have a particle beam and they irradiate uh, tissues with that, mouse tissues that have been humanized to, to have uh, tissues in them that are like humans. And you know they damage the tissue first with the radiation and then he's been able to show that with the curcumin he can recover the tissue. So it, it's not just prevention, it's actually recovery. Correct. Okay, that's fascinating. Yes. So these are the kind of technologies that um, are necessary when we, if we're going to go to the moon, where you're not protected by the Van Allen radiation belts, you're not protected by the magnetosphere of the Earth, if you're going to go to Mars, we're going to have to have that protection in deep space. And of course, we need to really, you know, one of the reasons that I like to talk about the Parker Solar Probe and, and, and the other parts of the Science Mission Directorate, astro or uh, heliophysics, because we need, to, we need to be really good at being able to predict solar it's flares and like uh, corona mass ejections uh, so that we can protect our astronauts because the radiation environment is very dangerous well, in deep space. Well, here's the thing about this advance. It'll address cancer on Earth. Indeed. <laughs> it'll be, it will be able to, to reverse the effects of cancer, and there's all kinds of methods being developed. We're taking that off the top of the red risks. Yeah. So. Well, I, will, I, I, I need to learn more. I th thank you for sharing that. We got a, a question here? I've never known a NASA audience to be shy. Or, we got a question <laughs> over here. <laughs> Rob Saley at JPL. We're uh, very excited about returning to the moon, but we're also concerned about where the funds will come from and how that may impact other parts of the program, as well as with aerospace employment uh, pretty close to full tilt. Uh, if the funding is available, where will the workers come from to, to put that many more on the kinds of jobs that we do? Yeah, so um, a couple of things on the, the funding. Uh, we, we put together an amendment to the budget request for 2020 um, we've been working members of Congress to let them know uh, what that money will be used for. Um, that ultimately, the big chunk of that, gets us out of the gate for the start of the development of landers. 
Uh, you can't get to the moon if you don't have a lander. We haven't had a lander since 1972. We need a, we need a human-rated lander. That's a big piece. So a billion dollars of the 1.6 billion that we're asking for in the amendment to the budget request for 2020 um, is focused on getting that lander under, or multiple landers under development. Um, now, the members of Congress that I've talked to, in bipartisan fashion, we've had support from, from members on both sides of the aisle. Um, and I think that's important. It's a story that needs to be told because this is not a political, a partisan kind of effort. This is an all of America, um, across the board effort, um, and, and we're getting that. Um, if we were to end up in a CR, uh, I think it would have been more problematic, but it looks like we now have a budget agreement. Um, that is going to give us, and this is a budget agreement between the House and the Senate, that gives us a higher top line number on the discretionary side of the ledger. Um, now, the, the, the key is, what has not been allotted at this point, is the Commerce Justice Science Appropriation Bill on that discretionary side of the ledger. And that's, of course, where NASA is funded, Commerce Justice Science. There's 12 appropriation bills that constitute that discretionary side. Once we get the top line for the CJS, then the question is, what part is going to go to the S piece, the science piece? And NASA falls in there. I will tell you, we have amazing support um, from members that matter on the appropriations committees, um, and, and we want to continue to, to grow that support. Now, what I was just talking about now is the year 2020. Um, what we're building today is the 2021 budget request. And everybody is aware that the 2021 budget request is going to go up from the 2020 budget request. Know this, for the 2020 budget request, I was very clear with everybody I talked to that if you try to cannibalize the science mission directorate of NASA, and I know you mentioned JPL, that means you're very interested in planetary science and other science. If you try to cannibalize the, the science mission directorate of NASA to achieve that end state, going to the moon in 2024, you're going to create a partisan fight and you'll never achieve the end state. And we don't want to do anything that creates a partisan divide when it comes to science and exploration of space. That's number one. Number two, um, I was also clear because there were some folks that were suggesting, well, you know, we could, we could take it from the International Space Station. And I want to be clear, I was very clear then as well. We have tried that before. Uh, the Space Exploration Initiative back in the 1990s, um, and that created a, not a partisan divide, but a parochial divide between, you know, basically Texas, Florida, and Alabama said we're not going that direction. So the, the challenge is this. As you identified, going to the moon is not cheap. We all know that. We also know that if you cannibalize science, if you cannibalize the International Space Station, you will never achieve the end state that is desired because it becomes partisan very rapidly. And this is not secret. History has proven this over and over again. It's been tried and it has failed. So I've made that very clear to, to everybody I've talked to. The heavier lift now comes after 2020 when we put together 2021 because the budget number is going to have to go up again. The lander is not going to be cheap or the multiple landers will not be cheap. The gateway is not going to be cheap. There is a development cycle here. It follows a normal bell curve. It starts out low, it gets higher, and it'll eventually come back down. But each one of these capabilities that we're developing also need, we've got to keep in mind why we're doing this. We're feeding forward to Mars. We're building the architecture to get to Mars. The president has said very clearly, this is his direction, put an American flag on Mars. He said it yesterday, as a matter of fact, again. That's an important thing. We have to remember what we're trying to achieve. And, of course, I will make the case all day, every day, as to what helps us get there and what prevents us from getting there. I've been making that case. The 1.6 billion that we requested for 2020, we got the money, and it didn't come out of any part of NASA. And I will tell you, that is not the history. Um, it was not an easy, it was not easy to go through that process, but we got it done, and now we're moving on to 2021. We still have to get, uh, we still have to move forward with um, with with uh, getting Congress on board. But with this budget agreement. Um, and our communication that we need this higher top line for the S in Commerce Justice Science, uh, I, think, I think we have an opportunity to get there. Know this, I am talking to everybody and advocating as strongly as I can what helps us get there and what slows us down. I know your concern and, and I share it. Yeah. All right. Yes. <laughs> I, 
Great question. So the question was about uh, my vision for the, the, the military kind of element of going to the moon and beyond. I, so I think it's, this is an important distinction to make. And it goes, it goes straight to elements of national power and who NASA is and who the, the, the military is, who the Department of Defense is. So the Department of Defense is responsible for fighting and winning wars. NASA is responsible for doing exploration, research, discovery, science. That's what NASA does. Now, there, there are opportunities where what NASA develops has military application, and of course what the military develops has NASA application. That is absolutely true, and we see that throughout history. Our first astronauts went into space on intercontinental ballistic missiles. For goodness sake, there is a relationship here that is undeniable. It is also true um, that NASA has a unique role to play in elements of national power, and I, I know I, is, I can't tell because the lights. Are you a major or lieutenant colonel? You're a major. So you're, you're probably, you've probably gone through a joint professional military education or you're going through it to become a lieutenant colonel. You, you probably learn in there about DIME, the different elements of power, diplomatic, information, military, economic. NASA plays on the diplomatic elements of power very strongly. Uh, the International Space Station is a perfect example. Uh, experiments from 103 different countries have been on the International Space Station. Talk about a tool of diplomacy. Uh, we've had astronauts from dozens of countries on the International Space Station, a tool of diplomacy. Fifteen nations living in, fifteen nations, I should say, operating the ISS now for almost 20 years. The, the relationship between the United States and Russia on the International Space Station is unique. It has been kept above all of the, the terrestrial political geopolitics that we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. And I think that's an important diplomatic channel of communication. So we play diplomacy, di diplomatically. The eyepiece in dime, information. Uh, we talk about a, Apollo 8. When we, when we sent astronauts around the moon for the first time, Christmas Eve, 1968, um, they, they did a broadcast from the moon on Christmas Eve. One out of every four people on the planet either heard or saw that broadcast. That's a tool of information power that only NASA can deliver, and that information went deep behind the Iron Curtain where tens of millions of people that otherwise would never have seen or heard anything from the United States saw and heard our astronauts from the moon. Of course, Apollo 11, it wasn't one out of every four, it was one out of every one. And even today, generations like mine that weren't alive know the story all too well and the 50th anniversary just demonstrated. That information power of the Apollo program still <laughs> resonates unbelievably all across the world. And here's why it matters. I'll tell you why it matters, and this is important. Um, when I, JPL, I was out at JPL not too long ago uh, for the InSight landing. When we landed InSight on Mars, this was in November of, of last year, it was on the cover of every newspaper worldwide, including Tehran. They don't often say nice things about the United States of America, especially a newspaper that declares itself the semi-official newspaper of the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps. That group of people specifically doesn't say nice things about the United States of America. And yet here they had an article about NASA that was positive. And the last paragraph was all about the international partners that were with us when we went to Mars. It ha NASA has a tool that can shape the perceptions of young people all across the world towards the United States in a positive way when a lot of times we don't get that kind of, that, that kind of outreach. That's the tool of information that NASA brings strategically to the United States of America. Diplomacy, information, and then the, the M. When people talk about national power, the M is a big capital M. It's what everybody sees. We've got these geographic combatant commands all around the world. They see that strong military hard power. We don't play there. We intentionally don't play there. Why? <laughs> because we want these partnerships. We want to make sure that the D and the I are strong. And if we start playing in the military realm, uh, then, then it's problematic. And then on the economic piece, we, we've talked a little bit about the industrialization of space and how it's going to be an export for the United States of America. NASA plays there in a major way and a whole host of other things. Know this, though. Uh, before I was the NASA administrator, I was a member of the House of Representatives. On the Strategic Forces Subcommittee, which has jurisdiction over the national security space-based capabilities, I supported the Space Corps. Um, you could call it the Space Force if you want. It, it didn't create a separate service secretary. It reported to the Secretary of the Air Force, but like the Marine Corps reports to the Navy, the Space Corps would report to the Secretary uh, of the Air Force. But it was a separate military service that could compete for funding on its own. 
I believed in that then. I voted yes. It got strong bipartisan support. It went to the full armed services committee. Again, got strong bipartisan support yet again. It went to the House of Representatives and it got 344 votes, bipartisan for a Space Corps separate from the Air Force, much like the Marine Corps is separate from the Navy. That's what it got in the House of Representatives. It went to the Senate and it died there. That being said, um, we look at the Air Force budget. I know you're an Air Force major. You look at the Air Force budget, it is, it, is, it is pretty steady over time. And yet, the biggest threats to the United States of America today are in space and cyber. And so, what are they gonna cannibalize? They're, they're gonna cannibalize the air domain in order to, to increase space and cyber. So, what, what, what I think we need is a separate military service that can compete for resources to create that cadre, organize, train, and equip that cadre to f not, not to fight and win wars, but organize, train, and equip that cadre that can be presented to the geographic combatant commands. And of course, US Space Command has now been reestablished by the president. He has the authority to do that. Under Goldwater Nichols, he has the authority to do that. Um, and he's done it. And so that, that is being established right now. It's a, it's a functional combatant command separate from a military service, but it is gonna enable us to fight and win wars in space. And then, and then, of course, on the, on the organized train and equip side, which is all the military services do, that organized train and equip side, that's going to require action by Congress. I supported it when I was in the House. I still support it today as the NASA administrator. I've been very clear about that, but know this, it's not what NASA does. Um, but it's, it is an enabler so that NASA can do what it does. Because when, when you have the enemies of the United States, I should say this, when you have the competitors of the United States, declaring that space is the American Achilles heel because every banking transaction requires a timing signal from GPS. There's no, you, you lose GPS, you lose, you lose banking in the United States of America. It's existential to our country. The, the people that want to threaten us know that. Every, you know, you look at the flows of electricity on the power grid requires a timing signal from GPS. You look at certainly um, the, uh, the flows of data on terrestrial wireless networks, timing signal from GPS. And then if you just look at the human condition as a whole, and people in this room have heard me talk about this over and over again, the way we communicate, direct TV, dish network, XM radio, I come from Oklahoma, internet broadband from space, you gotta have it in rural Oklahoma or else you don't have the internet. These have been transformative capabilities. Of course, these technologies born by NASA. In fact, born by the predecessor to NASA. Um, so, so, but that's just communication. Of course, you're, you're, as an Air Force officer, you're familiar with over the horizon, sending high resolution motion picture images over the horizon, lickety split so decision makers can make quick decisions. Um, but that's just communication. We talk about navigation, producing of food, producing of energy in a clean way, uh, disaster relief, national security, uh, of course, um, prediction of weather, understanding climate, all of these things. Space has elevated the human condition in ways that most people don't think about. What I hear about as the NASA administrator is, oh man, you guys did great. We have Tang and we have Velcro. <laughs> what NASA does is not about Tang and Velcro. And by the way, we didn't even invent those things. We use them, but we didn't invent them. The elevation of the human condition, the idea that we are proving how to increase crop yields while reducing water usage by 25% and preserving nitrates in the soil. And some of these technologies being utilized from the International Space Station, this is the kind of transformational elevation of the human condition that NASA is all about. And we're able to do those things and share it with the world because we don't play in the M. But the M is important to us because if the M is not protected, we can't do what we do as an agency. Um, I know I went way off in the weeds on all that. Uh, I, I'm getting a time signal here. Um, I, I want to, before, as I leave stage, um, I want to play this last video. Before we start the video, I, I, I want to say this. When we go to the moon in, in 2024, um, we've been given a direction. The direction is this. The next man and the first woman on the moon will be Americans. I wanna, th that came from the Vice President of the United States at the National Space Council. What he is declaring is that we are going to put a woman on the moon next, and we're going to do it in 2024. Why is that important to me? Because I have an 11-year-old daughter. And we go back to the 1960s, uh, it, was all, it was all test pilots, fighter pilots. We love Apollo, transformational for the United States of America. But, it, but fighter pilots and test pilots, there were no opportunities for women in those days. Today, 
we have this very diverse, highly qualified astronaut corps that includes, includes women. Um, and we have an opportunity today under the Artemis Pro. We call it Artemis intentionally. Apollo had a twin sister in Greek mythology. And that twin sister happens to be the goddess of the moon. And this time when we go to the moon, we go with a very diverse, highly qualified astronaut corps. We call it Artemis. When I got off the, off the plane yesterday, I'm walking to, to baggage claim. Gentleman stopped me. I, forgive me if I can't remember your name right now, but I know you're in the audience. And said, hey, uh, uh, let me guess. You're going to talk about the Artemis generation. Yes, I'm going to talk about the Artemis generation. <laughs> I'm going to talk about it over and over and over again. Because while this audience may have heard it, Look, I come from the political arena. Other audiences have to hear it, and they have to hear it 10 times before they remember it once. So I'm not just talking about it. We made a video. This video is called The Artemis Generation. Enjoy. Thank you. 50 years ago, we went to the moon. We called it Apollo. What many people don't know is that Apollo had a twin. She was a woman named Artemis, goddess of the moon. We are returning to the moon. As a new generation of explorers. This time to stay. And to prepare to achieve humanity's next giant leap of sending the first human missions to Mars. We believe our course will redefine what is possible. That we will discover life-saving, earth-changing science. And that the challenges ahead will inspire generations. This is our manifest. For all who wondered if we could return, for all who dreamed of pressing beyond. This is your calling. We go for all of America. We go. We go as the Artemis generation. We go.